Good morning, brothers. Good morning. Good morning. I want to start off by asking you a question. Uh, what is, I know I'm, I'm speaking to a crowd of guys and probably not fans of the Disney organization, but I want to ask you, what is the best Disney movie? Best Disney movie. What'd you say? Josh, what'd you say? Incorrect. Incorrect. <laughs> incorrect. <laughs> Is that correct? In- incorrect. <laughs> correct. Say it louder. The Lion King. The Lion King. <laughs> um, without a doubt, the best Disney movie is The Lion King. Uh, one memorable part of that movie for me is when Simba, he's all grown up, uh, but he's unsure of himself. He knows that he's, he's got to conquer the kingdom, and uh, the kingdom promised by his father, he hears Mufasa's voice in the sky, it's James Earl Jones, and he says, Simba, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Our text today is given to Israel for the purpose of remembering, for the purpose of reminding them who God is and his covenant promises in order to motivate his people to be devoted to the Lord before they go and conquer the land that they were promised to receive. The text is given to us today for the purpose of not remembering who we are, but remembering whose we are. Remember whose you are and to whom we owe our love to. Please open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. The text says, Hear, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons. Speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. You shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would equip these men today. I pray, Lord, that we would all be humbled before the one true God. I pray, Lord, that Jesus himself would encourage us through his word, for he is the living word, and that he'd build us up, that we'd be convicted of sin, and, Lord, that we would be delighted in you and your love for us, and, Lord, that we would magnify the name of the Lord together. In Christ's name, amen. There are four points to this sermonette. I'm not sure how much of an et it will be, but um, point number one is divinely different. Verse four, divinely different. Point number two is devotion and deeds. Verse five. Point number three is discipline. Verse six. And verses seven through nine, point number four, diligence in discipling. The book of Deuteronomy is a series of sermons delivered by Moses to the people of Israel. It's not new law, uh, but it's the original law that Moses is summarizing and commenting on about 40 years after God delivered that law to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 20, okay? Which is why the the term Deuteronomy means second law or copy of this law. Our chapter today, uh, verse chapter 6, right before it, in chapter 5, Moses is beginning his, his second sermon in the plains of Moab uh, at the very end of the 40 years where Israel has been wandering. And Moses, rises, Moses summarizes the Ten Commandments, uh, God's covenant, again, to a new generation of Israelites. The first generation, they had died out. And he's saying, listen, I'm going to die soon. Don't make the same mistakes as the old generation. When you enter the promised land, remember the covenants. Remember, remember, and remember what the Lord requires of his people. So in our chapter, chapter 6, Moses is summarizing the Ten Commandments, and he's zooming in on 
on these Ten Commandments, right? But then he takes it a step further in our verses, and he, he zooms in on the one greatest commandment. The one greatest commandment. So it's sort of like uh, if you grew up in college a couple years ago, right? It's the Spark Notes, right? The Spark Notes is chapter, chapter 5, and here we have the one-sentence summary of the greatest commandments, the greatest law, okay? And this is the law that shows God's divinely different. He's divinely different. So point number one, he's divinely different. Here, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. This verse actually, throughout all Jewish history pretty much, has been recited probably more than any other verse uh, that they recite. It's called the Shema, because the word Shema means here. It's the Hebrew word for here. Pay attention, pay attention, okay? It's an imperative. Listen up, O Israel, listen to this. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is alone, Israel's God. The Lord alone is our God. He is the only one. This isn't a statement that when I first looked at it, I thought it was supporting the Trinity, right? That the unity and internal unity of the Trinity, but, but really as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but it's actually a statement of exclusivity, of monotheism. And the reason why we know that is because this whole passage parallels the first commandment back in Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before or besides me. Plus, Moses is basically continuing his argument from two chapters earlier in Deuteronomy 4. He says, who else? What other God attempted to go and take a nation for himself amongst the midst of the other nations? By trials, by signs, with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm? Who else did that to you? And then in verse 34, it says, to you it was shown, why, Israel, that you might know that the Lord is God. There's no other besides him. So this is a statement of exclusivity, that our God is not like the other gods, the nations, the Canaanites worships. He is chief. He is set apart. Remember the solar eclipse you guys saw on Monday, right? Did you look at it with your eyes? No, why not? It'll burn your eyes out, 93 million miles away. We worship the one God who made that. Who made that. We must revere him. We must acknowledge that he is peerless and he has no equal. He has no equal. And this would have been different from all the pagan nations uh, that surrounded them. That Yahweh alone is God. So Moses is pointing out the fact that God is the only game in town, people. Despite the claims of other religions today, of millions of people, despite their many fervent followers, there is only one God. There is no other deity but the God of the Bible. But I want to tell you this, brothers, to you, just knowing this is not enough. Because we see in James chapter 2, verse 19, James says, You believe that God is one. The same word we see in Deuteronomy 6. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So I want to ask you this question. You may know that God is one, but has it impacted your devotion to him? Or does it stay as head knowledge, not stirring up your affections? Has this teaching of Christ caused you to seek God with everything within you, that he is one? Moses is going to say that this should motivate us towards love. Point number one, God's divinely different. Point number two, devotion and deeds. Verse five, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. The proper response to the Lord's oneness is that he is the only true God is to what? To love him. That's what verse five says, to love him. I want to point out to you the relationship between verse four and verse five, right? He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And you could almost imagine a word there, Therefore, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And all your might. Jesus cites this commandment to the Pharisees in Matthew 22, verse 38. He says, this is the great and first commandment. So I ask you, well, why is this the greatest commandment? 
Why is this one the greatest commandment? And if you think about this, right? If you obey this commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, obedience to all the other commandments will follow, right? If you do that, then you're keeping the first half of the first ten of the Ten Commandments, and then all the other ones will flow after that, right? If you love God, you're not going to commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. If you love God, you're not going to murder or steal from your neighbor because why? You're satisfied in loving God. That's why it's the greatest summative commandment. And this command is an imperative to love God completely. Not that just we should obey him like some kind of uh, like robot or some kind of, you know, uh, like a peasant obeys a tyrant, but rather this is a covenant established by love. Obey him on the basis of, of love for him. Covenant, loyalty. This was unheard of in the other ancient Near Eastern religions. Like Marduk and, and Baal were not uh, demanding love from their followers. We're not evoking his followers to, to love them. But he is the only true God. There is no other God. There is no other gospel that we have. Therefore, you should be, brothers, you should be entirely devoted to him with everything that you are. It's kind of like this. When you, when you get married, when you get married, Lord willing, you have, you have one wife. I'm just going to talk to one guy here. You've got, you've got one wife, brother, all right? She's the recipient of all your love. You're not looking around to other women. Your love is exclusively for her. And the same thing is happening here, right? It would be strange to say, I, I love you, wife, and then express that love to other women, right? That's what we do when we chase after idols. No, it's your one wife. Everything you have is devoted to her. But, but not only that God is one is the reason why we should love him. He's also done things. He's also done deeds. If you read Deuteronomy chapters 6 through 11, you see God's covenant to, to work, to motivate his people to love. Paragraph after paragraph, right? The Lord saying, I did this for you. I did this for you. Look at, I did this for you. Even in verse 12, let's look at it. Verse 12 in chapter 6, let's look at it. He says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God and you shall worship him and swear by his name. I did this for you. And it also shows us that the Lord is instructing Israel how they're going to keep these commandments. He's not saying, you got to muster this up in your own strength. you got to somehow stir up your moral, moral fibers here and try, to, try as hard as you can to obey these commandments. He's like, no. This is going to be a relationship based on faith and, and based on what I've done, based on the mighty deeds that God himself has done in redemption. Israel, how are you going to keep from... You know, when you go into the land in Canaan how, and you're prosperous, how are you going to stay in fidelity to God and not slip into idolatry? He's like, remember what I did. Remember that I brought you out of the house of slavery in Egypt. And this is similar to us. In the New Testament, Romans 6, Paul says, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin because Jesus Christ died for you and alive to God because he's been raised from the dead. And then, therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. We have to remember and acknowledge the Lord's acts as the foundation for the power by which we can even obey Him. So Israel, love me. Be devoted to me, not because uh, uh, of, of what you can muster, but because of who I am, the one true God, and because what I've done for you. Look at what I've done for you in covenants. So what should be our response for this? You should love me, and that will be the foundation for why you obey me. And we think, like, throughout Deuteronomy, we, sh we see God share his love for his people. In, in chapter 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him. Love. You know, I, I think in New York, as Christians, our circle of, of Christians, we run into a lot of people uh, in other churches who really just emphasize the love of God, 
right? They don't talk about God's justice. They don't talk about God's wrath. But, Paul, when you, when you, show, when you have a diamond, right? When you have a diamond, uh, the jeweler puts it, what's the background of that diamond? It's like a black velvet background, right? Because the diamond of the gospel, the beautiful gospel, is, is most uh, emphasized on the black backdrop. The love of God is most emphasized when we know his justice, that, that there is no escaping from sin apart from Christ, that Jesus is the only escape. If you're outside of Christ today, sin, your sin will be punished one way or another. It's going to be punished with you in hell for all eternity, or it's going to be punished on the cross 2,000 years ago. Now, the love of God is not beautiful unless you know that, right? Unless you know God's wrath and God's justice. But brothers, I don't want you, the pendulum to swing the other way here and us to just be like, well, don't forget about the justice and wrath. The love of God is boundless. We can never get enough of that. We can never truly understand that enough. The, the lyrics that say, Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love, right? If all the ocean were ink, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. We love, we could even love God because why? He loved us first, with an everlasting love. And he demonstrated that love for us by his righteous life and by drinking the whole cup of God's wrath as, as God's wrath poured down on him on the cross. That's how he demonstrated that love. And guess what? He, he did it. He did it. It's an action. He, he didn't just say, hey, I love you guys and, and leave us in the lurch, leave us to perish in our own sin. Love is a verb. And here in verse, uh, verse 17 Love here is a verb. It's a verb. Sorry, verse 7, not 17. Verse 7, love is a verb. It is an action. Moses says, use your capacities by which we should express that love. Right? He says, all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, but the way you demonstrate your strength is not just by talking about it. Right? You show your strength. And when we love God, it is most clearly evident by the way we obey Him. Jesus said... If you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. That's an action. Look down at verse 17. Moses agrees with this. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his provisions and his statutes which he has commanded you. God doesn't just accept lip service from you brothers. And likewise, he doesn't just accept mindless robotic acts of service where your heart's not into it, right? It must be an equation of both things. It must be a, a delighted heart. Oh, Lord, I want to I serve you and love you and, and love you with all, all of who I am. And then it also must be demonstrated in, in action and, and obedience. Heart and soul. Heart and soul and strength. So Moses is going to explain specifically how we ought to express this love. What's the action, Moses? You're going to show us here. Point number two, devotion and deeds. Point number three, discipline. Verse six, discipline. Let's look at it. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. So the first place where God's word shall be is on your heart. If they aren't on your heart, it doesn't matter. I heard a politician uh, in my newsfeed say, I own a lot of Bibles. It doesn't matter unless it's on your heart. The word of God must be on your hearts. You can't love him with all your heart without having the word of God on your hearts. It would be like telling a woman that I love you. No. Uh, it would be like telling a woman, like, I love you without knowing much about her, right? That doesn't seem very genuine. The heart in the ancient Near East was the center of thinking. Uh, there is no Hebrew word for mind. The heart is the center of thinking. It's the center of your emotions. It's where wisdom is located. It's, it's all about the affections and the heart. So I want to ask you a question. H how do we gain this heart that Moses is talking about in verse 5? How do I get a heart that knows that Yahweh alone is God and that I can be fully devoted towards Him? And the answer is, you write these words on the tablet of your heart. You get 
a heart that you need and you memorize the word of God and put it on your heart. In, in the process of memorizing scripture, you are internalizing these words. You are internalizing the word and then it shapes who you are. Your very worldview, what you think about politics, what you think about history, what you think about social issues, all of that is then shaped by God's word. And thereby that person gains the kind of heart they need to please God and not sin against him. We see this consistently throughout scripture, especially in the Psalms. If you look at Psalm chapter 119, what does it say? I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How about Psalm 1? Michael mentioned it to me the other day. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's how we're shaped by the word. That's putting the word of God on your heart. It's not just the casual perusing of the scriptures. Brothers, I think we're guilty of this. I know I am, or I'm just kind of, okay, I wake up, I'm going to just flip through my devotional today. I'm, I'm casual about it. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a situation where you wanted to bring a verse to your mind to fight temptation, or you wanted to bring a verse to your mind to encourage a brother, or you wanted to bring a verse to your mind because you were in some kind of discussion about doctrine and you wanted to like, oh, I know this is true, but I don't know exactly where it is in the scripture or what it is. Raise your hand if that has ever been true for you. Yeah, I know it's been true for me, for sure. We need to wield the sword of the spirit better, brothers. We need discipline in this area. Here's one thing that I do. I like to turn verses into songs. You know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I really expected Hunter and Grayson to sing that with me because <laughs> they'd know that from family night. You drop the ball, brothers. All right. Uh, I, know, I know guys that bring index cards to work and they have a friendly competition with their wife at the end of the day. So we need to be shaped. We need to be shaped by this. We need to be shaped. Um, if you skip down to verse 8 and 9 here, Scripture says you should also tie them as a sign to your hand. Right? These are all for, for remembering the Scriptures. And they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Uh, the reason why is so you don't forget, so you remember whose they are. And the wrong way to apply this would be to like, ta even though I know I have a tattoo of scriptures, I was, uh, I was backsliding during that time. But um, uh, the wrong way to apply this is to tattoo the scriptures on your body, or as, as the Jews do, they, they write something called the, they put something called the mezuzah. It's like a wooden plaque on their door, and they have scripture written within it. Uh, that's not the right way to apply this. Uh, and the imagery here is actually picked up from the book of Revelation. In Revelation 13, speaking of the mark of the beast, Scripture says, And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So the imagery here is that those that follow Satan and this, this beast, they have... They have things that are symbolic. Uh, they, they think the thoughts of the beast, and they do the actions of the beast with their hand. So it's the same idea here, but flipped. Having the word of the Lord on your forehead means you think God's thoughts after him. Having the, the mind of Christ. And, and he is the one who controls and compels your thinking. And having it on the hands means you, you do according to what he says. You're a doer of the word of God. And your hands operate on the basis of his word, consistent with his word. That's what's being communicated here. But ultimately, brothers, we, we need to practice what we preach. We need to know the Bible and let the Bible shape us here. And this can be done. It's a possible thing. Um, but I, I, I don't want you to miss the point here. This is not what I'm saying, that if you memorize the Bible, you will automatically have a heart that will please God. That's not what I'm saying here. Okay? All over Deuteronomy, God is going to impress upon the people their need for God to do something. Yes, we memorize Scripture, but God himself needs to do something. He keeps repeating phrases like, Yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. In, in chapter 529, if only they had such a heart in them, 
for fear to fear me and to keep all my commandments. Some translations will say, who will give them such a heart as this always? So on one hand here, you have God saying, uh, who's going to give them a heart to keep my commandments? And then uh, after that, he says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And later he says, circumcise your heart. So, so what are we to do with these verses here? We must reconcile this by thinking and expecting that God is, is going to give a new covenant solution. And he prophesies this in Ezekiel when he says that the Lord will take out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. That who, Who's going to give these people a heart? It's going to be God himself to give them a heart. There is hope here for Israel, not in anything that they can do, but, but something that God does for them. And later on in Deuteronomy 30, he says, Moreover, the Lord, your God, will circumcise your heart. He's the one who does it. So at the same time, brothers, we are still responsible. It's God's sovereignty and man's responsibility for hiding the words in our hearts. We cannot volitionally, in our inner man, follow God's commandments without him changing our heart. But also, you cannot know that unless you know the word, right? It cannot, like a lot of times for people, it stays here and it doesn't go down here but it'll never get here until it's here first. So memorize the word of God, brothers. Memorize the word of God. Be disciplined to do that. Love him and study his words. Study his words. So to recap, verse four, Israel's greatest theological truth is the Lord is one. Verse five, the greatest commandments. Because of this, you should love him with everything that you are. And then verse six, the prescription for how, how do you get to be this kind of person? You put the word in your heart, you memorize it. So what do we expect to come next? What do we expect Moses to say after saying this? He says this, point number four, diligence in discipling. Verse seven, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So what comes next is very countercultural for us. The you it's masculine, it's singular. Singular. It's not just you, nation. It's not just you, church. It is you, individual father. Singular, masculine. Shall teach them. Shall teach them what? The words from verse 6. Diligently to your sons. Some translations have children. But I think we can understand. He's telling us to teach this to your children. And the word teach here is, you shall repeat them constantly. This is designed to foster memorization. As the father repeats these words constantly, the words, the children in the family would have would have learned them and would have memorized them. You shall repeat them, not in a suffocating way. You shall repeat them and then you shall discuss them. Repeat, discuss. That's the formula. Repeat them. Try to have a conversation. Discuss them. And the setting here is when you're walking by the way and in your house and when you lie down and when you rise. It is both to individual children and your collective family. So first I ask you, what kind of man is going to do this? What kind of man is going to be constantly repeating these verses to their children? And the answer in in verses four and six is the kind of man that knows Yahweh is the only living God and he's the only game in town and that man loves him with all his heart and that man has the word on his heart. He's equipped with the word of God. That's the only kind of man who's in a position to do this. That's the only kind of man who's motivated to do this, to kind of pursuing these conversations and repeating the words to his children as they rise up, as they go to sleep. Because why? The Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You could fake it for a season, but out of the overflow of your heart, you will do what you desire to do. If you desire comfort, you're not going to go home and have devotions with your family. You're going to go home and watch TV, and your family will be centered around that. Now, what if you don't have kids? Well, married men find these instructions in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. As Christ cleansed his bride by the washing of the water, husbands, you're, you're here to love your wives. And the best way you can love your wives is by washing her in the pure water of the word. Bring the word into your home. 
And that is also through family worship, through family worship. Later in Ephesians, Paul says to, ch- to fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In the instruction of the Lord. A lot of times we read that verse, we're like, oh yeah, that's a verse for discipline. It's also a verse for instruction. Instruct, teach your kids, fathers, your teachers, your teachers. Dads, don't expect anyone else to do this for you. God gave this command to you directly as Jesus stands in front of you and tells you, instruct your kids. Here's some ways that we could do this. One, bring them to church. You're bringing your kids into the ecosphere where sound doctrine happens, where they could visibly see the love of God towards other believers. All men will know that you're my disciples. Your children will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. You're also bringing them to a place where they hear the gospel all the time. Like, who would not want to do that? And also, what kind of message are we sending our kids and other families when, when, we, when we pray and sing? What, what is the message you're saying to your kids by the way you sing and by the way you pray and worship? Also, you're showing them that this is a top priority in the life of a believer, right? No soccer game, no gymnastics, nothing is going to come and interfere with the regular gathering of of God's people on the Lord's day. Nothing is more important than that. What's another way we could do this? When we we travel on the way, right? When you're traveling, uh, this is like an unplanned teachable moment. Like when when I'm, I'm looking at the sun, right, through my little glasses there, uh, and I'm telling my kids, look what God has done. Look what God has made. Right? You teach them about God's power and his sovereignty and his faithfulness. The fact that we could even measure that and like that's going to come down to the minute is God's faithfulness and the power of his word. Teach them those things. Also, when I drive, I like to play catechism and songs in the car. Seeds Family Worship is a really good resource for that. And I could recommend some other ones. When else are we could do this? When we sit down in our house, when we lie down, when we get up. My family, we do devos, family devos, okay? Uh, Every morning, we work on catechism on particular verses with my wife. Um, Have it read at a particular time in the evening, maybe after dinner. Just bring your Bible to the table. Before bed, maybe you need to establish a regular bedtime for your young kids, and this is the time every day that we do devotions, um, I know some families, they read a psalm every day until the family could recite it without looking at it. Other families, I, I know, they, they read the text being preached, like they find out what's going to be preached on Sunday, and they read that text every single day of the week, especially if it's a narrative, then they ask their kids, what's going to happen next? Can they tell them what's going to happen next? Maybe you have a little bit of older kids about to drive a car and say, you know, for you to drive this car... Or a rite of passage for you as a man or a young lady would be, I want you to memorize a book of this Bible. If you memorize a book of the Bible, it's like a rite of passage. Um, This is the area where you teach them sound doctrine. This is the time and place in your house where you teach them God's attributes and biblical theology. Really practically, three tips. Keep it short. Keep it between 10 and 15 minutes. Keep it regular. And also be flexible as well. Be flexible as well. But don't give it up. Don't give it up. You got to read the Word, right? This is all that's, that's, that's prescribed in Scripture. You got to read the Word together. You got to pray together. And you got to sing together. Those are the three main ingredients. My daughter especially loves doing this in our bed. She likes doing this in our bed. So I love what, what Pastor Phil... Pastor Phil uh, you want to just briefly share what, what do you do with, in terms of song, like with your family, like briefly? So what I do is I take the songs that we sang, like the Sunday prior, and I pick one song each night, and we sing one of the songs that Dale Hunter, uh, Dan McCleary, has sung with us uh, on that Sunday morning. So there's four or five songs, and we do one each night. And it reinforces that what we're singing there, we're singing here. So there's a connection between the church and the home. Hmm. So why don't we do this? What's the reason why men will not do this? Some men are not believers. So you can't give to your children what you don't have. Other men will be drawn away by other activities 
They would rather gather their family around the TV. Um, some men don't feel equipped to do this. They don't have the implanted word on their hearts. And other men, and I could relate to this category, they feel a lot of shame because they let a lot of time pass where they haven't been a good leader in the home. Um, they didn't stick with it. Maybe they started it and they fell off and they didn't stick with it. Or maybe they're living in sin and they're ashamed to bring up the things of God with their family. In that case, that brother needs to repent. Um, but if you feel like you're struggling with this, I want to encourage you to get back on the horse. Everyone could start somewhere. Yeah, it's going to be awkward at first, but let it be awkward. Let it be awkward. You know, like the more consistent you are like a farmer with patience and consistency, you'll see the fruit and it will be a staple in your home. If, if you haven't started this with your family, what you should say is this. You should say, look, gather your family together. The Bible teaches me that I should be leading family worship with you. I want to start today. I want to obey God. Uh, I have a lot to learn. Will you, will you do this with me? Will you join me? Say that. Say that to them. We see this all throughout church history. Uh, we see Martin Luther wrote this. He said, Every house is a school, and the head of the household is the bishop and priest in our house. Uh, we see this in, in chapter 6, verse 1. Moses says, Now this is the commandment, the statues and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. So in this sense, we see a model where God is teaching Moses, and Moses is saying, I'm teaching you. It's, that's patriarchy right there. Not in the way the world thinks it. Patriarchy just means father rule. It's good to have a dad around the house. It's good for the dad to lead. That's, that's, that's just a fact. Okay? When people are saying down with father, down with patriarchy, they're just saying down with fathers. Fathers is good. Fathers are good. So we see this, this model brought to us, and now you are the father, perhaps, in your home, and it's your turn to take the reins. Now, the scarier question is, what happens if we don't do this? Hosea 4 says this, scary scene. He said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. So the fathers forgot the law, and then the God forgot their children. We see the same thing happen in Nahum, right? God, uh, in Nineveh. God preserves Nineveh, saves Nineveh, but they don't teach the next generation, and they're destroyed in the book of Nahum. We're about to teach through the churches of Revelation. At some point, those churches where God brought them to judgment, and I don't think any of those churches exist today, at some point, there was a last generation of that church where that generation wasn't faithful or that generation didn't teach their children. Like, imagine being the last generation in your community to have the light of the gospel. What a sad and shameful thing. So in conclusion, I just want to leave you with two points. Jesus was the Word, and he knew the Word, and he said, let the, let the children come to me. Don't we want this? Don't we want this, brothers? Uh, isn't our family valuable to us? And isn't God worthy of your family's worship? He's worthy of it. And what better way to speak the gospel into their lives than gather them around together? What better way to transmit your core beliefs, to share your heart with your own kids? What better way to provide a space where they could ask you questions about life? There's no better way. There's no better way. This is the model uh, for you to live as an example to them as well. So stand as men and make your home a place of worship like Jacob did in Genesis 35, which I'll read in closing. But the other thing is, uh, for more mature fathers here, I want to charge you, if you've been doing a really good job with this, invite younger men in the church to your homes around the same time that you're doing this with your families. Your kids will love it. And also, um, those younger men get to see an example of what this looks like. Because it's one thing for, like, for me to tell you now and for you to hear it. It's another thing for you to see it. Like, I, I emulate some brothers that I've seen every night. I like, step into their shoes and I'm, I, 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 I do the same things they do that I've seen. So if you do this good, invite those younger brothers, the younger couple around to do this. And in closing, I want to read from Genesis 35. We should be like Jacob here. He says this. 
So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. Let's pray. Lord, help us to stand as men and make our homes a place of worship to you, Lord. Uh, Let us put away anything that would keep us from coming before you and worshiping you. Lord, let us walk in faithful obedience to you, to love you, to love the only God with everything within us, to put your word on our hearts, Lord, and to teach others. Equip us, help us to walk in obedience. I know you are faithful to your children, Lord. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.